Hello everybody, this is John Finn, churchwithoutwallsinternational.org or cwoi.org. And uh, anyway, talking about the steps of discipleship to talk today, talking about the grand poobah, the bishop so-and-so. Have you noticed all the titles that we have in, uh, in, in that go in front of some people's names? You know, it, it's like if I even see that as a friend request, I don't even, I don't even acknowledge that. Apostle so-and-so and Bishop so-and-so. Years ago, I was getting off a plane and, and going to speak at a church, and, uh, and a young man met me, and he said, I'm your armor bearer. And he insisted on taking my, my computer case and my suitcase. And I told him, I said, no, let me carry my own stuff. Do you have anything? Let me help you. You know, I'm to serve you. But uh, nothing wrong with that. His heart was good. He was following instructions, uh, etc. But there was this whole thing of let me be your armor bearer. And it's like, you know, for when I read my Bible, promotion in the, in the scripture is downward uh, to, to greater sacrifice and, and greater love. And so today I'm talking about some priorities and some things that we should be rejoicing in rather than talking about the titles and getting distracted with all the different things that are out there. I mean, have you noticed some of the fun things out there that people play with the spiritual gifts like they're some sort of a toy? I mean, back in the 70s, it was growing legs out and casting out demons and, and all sorts of stuff like that that was like little toys that, that of little children. And I want to share with you some scripture and some personal experience where the Lord reestablished some of the priorities for us. And I, re I turn you to Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 21. Jesus had already sent the 12 out, and they had laid hands on the sick and cast out demons and, and cleansed the lepers and raised the dead and everything else, and they were rejoicing. So Jesus sends 70 others. In other words, he sends 35 teams of two uh, out and gives them authority over demons and everything else and the authority to use his name. Well, Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 21, comes back, and, they, and the 70 returned with joy, rejoicing, saying, Lord, Lord, even the demons are subject to us through your name. And he said to them, Behold, I, I saw Satan falling from heaven. And it's literally, he said, I, I was there to see, or I saw Satan having fallen from heaven. In other words, Jesus is saying, guys, let me put it this way. A lot of people read that verse where they come back and Jesus says, I saw Satan from heaven. And they think that he is referring to that moment in time where it's like, you come back, you've used my name, I see Satan falling from heaven. And, you know, that'll preach to a degree, even though it's not grammatically and contextually accurate. He wasn't saying at that moment after the 70 came back, I saw Satan falling from heaven because we know Satan had fallen from heaven eons before. He was fallen already in the Garden of Eden with, when he tempted Adam and Eve. So Jesus wasn't making a statement that he saw Satan falling at that moment. That's not it at all. That wouldn't be theologically correct because, again, Satan fell long before uh, the earth was created, evidently, and certainly he was in a fallen condition with Adam and Eve. And if you read it in the Greek, it's actually more of a past tense. In other words, they come back, Jesus, Jesus, the demons are subject to us through your name. It's amazing. And he said, guys, guys, I was there when Satan had fallen from heaven. So don't rejoice that the devils are subject, that the demons are subject, and literally the spirits are subject to you by my name. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And there Jesus established the priorities for us. In fact, the word written there is not grapho, G-R-A-P-H-O, uh, where we get the word uh, <laughs> graphite, which is the, the pencil lead, you know, that we call the pencil lead. He did not use rejoice, not that the demons are, are subject to you, but rejoice in the, that your names are written in heaven. He did not use grapho, which means just merely to write it on a piece of paper. He used engrapho which we would say would be engraved. And it, it was used in, in Philo's time, uh, in classical times, it was mentioned to use for only official documents, solemn official documents, including, uh, in Greek city-states, including, in Grapha was used to record the names of the citizens of the city-state. So Jesus is saying here, when they come back, Jesus, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us through your name. He said, guys, I was there when Satan fell from heaven, so don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you, but you need to rejoice that your names are engraved in heaven, in official documentation in heaven. That's where your priority should be. You know, Paul had said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, he said, I'm fearing, I'm afraid for you, lest Satan through his subtlety, through his craftiness, 
Uh, in fact, that word craftiness in 2 Corinthians 11, 3 means, um, it means always working, always working for the negative. Uh, Satan, through his subtlety, through his craftiness, would, would cause you to believe another gospel, receive another spirit, and, and uh, another Jesus. And, and he, you know, Paul's not wanting us to leave the simplicity, and that's essentially what Jesus is talking about here. We shouldn't get a big head over the fact that demons are subject to us through our name or when somebody gets healed or we get a word for somebody. It's, we should be rejoicing in the fact that our names are engraved in official documentation in heaven. And so Jesus sets the, the, the record straight. Now, if you were like you or I, you know, I got saved when I was a teenager. I mean, yeah, we found it amazing that we could lay hands on people and they would be healed. Um, the Lord set it in the right perspective for me years ago. It was, uh, it was, there was a two-week period from Easter of 1975, uh, Easter night. That night, a group of us were meeting, group of us teenagers were meeting in someone's home, and a, a brother named David, and he is still a pastor of a church. He's a pastor of a church today. But David had a word. He said, the Lord's been speaking to somebody about healing and teaching them about healing. Now's the time to, to start. And I, I gingerly, I carefully raised my hand because I knew the Lord had been teaching me about healing. And he went, he kind of motioned like, okay. And so it's like, there's maybe eight or 10 of us, 11 of us there. And kids from different schools were teenagers, you know, I'm like 16 years old or, or 17 or whatever. And uh, I said, anybody need healing? And up stepped a, a young girl with scoliosis. I mean, my, measurably scoliosis. One shoulder was, was raised above the other. And, and David said, go ahead. <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh, really? Um, you know, I had never laid hands on anybody before. But uh, David sensed that that word that, you know, now is the time sort of thing. And I just, I, what I did, I just started at her, about her waist on her back. And I just ran my fingers up her spine. I just felt led to do that and say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And it was immediately like, like a terrier getting a hold of a rat her spine started shaking and as it went up it was like that all the way up her spine and suddenly her her shoulders became level and she became normal and she could suddenly she was just excited she could touch her toes she could twist she could turn she was amazed that she'd been totally healed of scoliosis just like that well for the next two weeks it was like anybody who needed prayer for healing or excuse me anybody who needed healing got healed i didn't pray for anybody i followed jesus examples and the apostles examples they never prayed for healing for anybody they commanded and so I remember my mom, my mom was hearing about some of this and my mom had, had walked into the sharp corner of a desk and had badly bruised her thigh and she was limping, she could hardly walk. And she sat down one day, she said, well, if Jesus has given you this, this power to heal, then heal my leg. So I said, okay. So we went in the living room because it was, there was a big sofa there and I, I put, gently put my hand on my mom's thigh, uh, you know, right, right to my middle point, you know, above her knee. And I said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And I just lightly touched her on the forehead and boom, she goes on the sofa. Just, I didn't have anything to do. I didn't, it was amazing. And then our neighbor, uh, a couple days later, our neighbor had run his elbow through uh, a door, actually. He was carrying something or doing something and he just ran right into the door. It was all bruised. He could bar barely bend it. And he's like, oh, I hear you can heal people. And, and so I went over, I laid hands on it and immediately he got healed. You know what? After two weeks, it shut off. This is how the father kept my, my head <laughs> where it should be. And I said, Father, I said, what was that? For two weeks, it was like anybody I touched got healed. And he said this. He said, I just wanted to show you a little of what you're going to be doing in the future. And that was it. You know, that helped me keep my head where it should be. This was not a toy. This is not something to play with. And, 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 and we went through a time there as teenagers, too, where, <laughs> where it seemed like we ran into people that had demons, and, and we cast out a lot of demons. It was the first time I'd ever had a demon talk back to me, you know, different things like that. But it was for a specific time. And I believe the Lord did that so that, you know, as a young teenager, we could understand these are just tools of the trade. This is like having hammers and, and saws and screwdrivers, you know, in your, in your belt, this is not the focus of the attention. The focus of the attention is the fact that our names are written in heaven. So once again, in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 21, the disciples came back all happy, all excited. They'd healed the sick. They'd cleansed the lepers. They cast out demons. And they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us through your name. And Jesus said, guys, guys, don't rejoice in this because I saw Satan falling from heaven, having fallen from heaven in the it's past tense in the Greek. He said, but rejoice in this, that your names are engraved 
in heavenly documentation. And so I say that just in case you're, you're, you're starting to get off onto fad doctrines or a website that draws you aside or something like that. It's like, no, 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 stick back to the priorities. Your name is written in heaven. That's where everything flows. If Jesus, our Lord, says focus on that and everything flows from that simple truth, then stay hooked up to that. Stay in that stream. And don't get over here and all these little things and think you're something or that you've arrived because that's certainly none of us have arrived. Paul, even Paul said, I don't count myself to have apprehended in Philippians chapter 3 or to have attained. That's not it at all. It's just a very simple thing. We just focus on the fact that our names are engraved in the official documentation in heaven. Let's, let's use these things as tools, the name of Jesus as a tool to set people free, to bind up the brokenhearted, to open the eyes of the blind, not as our personal, personal toys or playthings or to get a big head thinking that we are something because we're not. It's all about Jesus. All right, I hope this has been a blessing to you. Talk to you next week.